So now we are joined by Dr. John Keller, the director of the Fisk Planetarium. John, thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Very excited for this first podcast. Yeah, it's going to be a blast. We're excited um, too. Really quick, would you briefly explain your backstory and how you ended up doing what you were doing? What brought you to being the director of the planetarium and other things that you do here at CU Boulder? Oy vey. Um, sure. So I went to my first planetarium show as a second grader at Capitol High School in Boise, Idaho. I distinctly remember that visit with the Clayton family and the Keller family. And that's when I first said, whoa, stars are pretty cool. Um, we'd moved from Los Angeles to Idaho right, right before then. And so I had the benefit of spending the rest of my childhood through high school growing up in Idaho, which has very dark skies. My parents got me a telescope when I was a sixth grader, kind of four years later. And, kind of, and I essentially knew from all through my high school years, and sorry, grade school through high school years, that I really liked astronomy. Um, when I went to college, I did not pursue that. I actually studied biology, um, and I didn't really know why I was studying biology, except that I liked science, and biology let me take some physics and take some chemistry and take some biology and take some astronomy and take some earth science. And so I generally had the opportunity to take lots of science classes, but I wasn't really focused around where I wanted to go with that degree. And so after I finished, after I got to junior year and declared my major as a biologist, I said, well, what am I going to do? And I was uh, presented with the opportunity to stay at Stanford for one more year and get a teaching credential and become a high school science teacher, which actually was perfect because I realized that I really liked science and getting to explain science, to get, work with science, work with students about science was really, really fulfilling. Um, during that time that I was teaching high school in the Bay Area, uh, after I graduated, um, I actually I also had the chance to work at NASA for several summers aboard the working with the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, which is a space which is an airplane that flies at about forty thousand feet to look at the infrared universe. And so I did summer work in, at NASA Ames Research Center, and I did school year work during the school year teaching high school students. And it was really through those five years of teaching and researching and teaching and researching that I realized that I did want to be an astronomer. I just hadn't realized that till I was 26. And so I um, actually then came to the University of Colorado Boulder uh, to, get a, to get a graduate degree in astronomy. Uh, I didn't have enough physics and math as my classmates. And so I actually took a lot of um, undergraduate physics classes that I hadn't had yet as a biologist. And I ended, up, um, I ended up finishing with a master's degree from CU Boulder, but it was actually an enrichment in my physics and math background. And then I ultimately finished my PhD in planetary science at the University of Arizona, uh, where, I, um, where I studied planetary science and Mars, but I also did astronomy education research. And so I think in doing that, in that transition from high school teaching to eventually becoming a professor, I realized that I liked doing astronomy, but I still liked teaching astronomy. And so I mostly did astronomy education research in grad school at Cal Poly, where I was for, for 10 years, and then here at CU Boulder, uh, where I've been for two and a half years now. Um, when I was finishing my graduate, when I was in my graduate program at Arizona, I, you know, I'd worked at Fisk when I was here as a, as a graduate student. And I had realized that I would always like to have been a professional employee at Fisk. But at the time that I was in grad school, uh, I was not able to be here yet. And so when I saw that, the, that Doug Duncan was retiring after being here 15, 15 years, I was really excited about the opportunity of being able to, to, return, to return to the planetarium. That's a probably a much longer winded answer than you wanted, but that's my backstory. No, that's perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. Um, so really quick, while you were here at CU for your grad school, what did you do at the planetarium? What was your role there? Yeah, so I was a navigator. Um, I navigated, uh, which is which our navigators at Fisk are the people who control what you're seeing in the visuals on the dome. This was back in 1999, 1998, when we didn't have the digital theater we have now. We had the the Zeiss Mark Six, uh, Zeiss Mark Six, Zeiss Mark Six, the Zeiss projector called Fritz. Pretty sure it's my. You guys can fact check me. Uh, Zeiss Mark Four, Five, or Six. Uh, and, um, and so we navigated with that planetarium projector system. 
Uh, I also presented, so I you know, taught classes. I taught in the sound lab, which we still have today. Um, and then lastly, I wrote the script for Kids in Space, which is a, a, a fourth through eighth grade show that we showed from 1999 until about 2013. Um, we're actually bringing Kids from Space back. Kids from Space 2 is coming back uh, this coming fall. Um, so a scriptwriter, navigator, and presenter. Very good. And Kids from Space was actually kind of a capstone project in your graduate experience. Is that right? Correct. So that was, that was you know, not a small thing to put together. So that'll be a lot of fun to see that kind of uh, reappear in the fist. Yeah, it was, it was part of a NASA grant that we had applied for and gotten funded to do um, to put together that show. Very cool. Um, and is there along that, you know, that path that you described, which is actually, I think, kind of uh, inspiring because it shows that you don't have to know what you want to do from square one in order to end up doing, you know, something that you really enjoy. Um, so that's pretty cool. But along the way, are there any things that you learned that you wish someone would have told you or that you could have experienced earlier so that you knew to expect that coming later? I think the main thing I would tell people is to give yourself a lot of self-compassion. Um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with knowing exactly what you do want to do. Like that was my dad's experience. He knew from age six that he wanted to be an engineer. He became a mechanical engineer. He did mechanical engineer things until he retired at 65. And that was his path. And that was awesome. Um, that was not me. And I wish that I had been just a little bit more um, acknowledging of the fact that it's okay to not know exactly what you want to do uh, at age six or age 18 or age 25 or age 32. Um, and to just realize that different people have different experiences and that's okay. Uh, I was, what I am grateful for is that I ultimately was always following what I like. I always, I always was trying to follow things that I knew that I would like. And so like, I spent a lot of time questioning at age 20 and 30, what I wanted to do. But I think through that process, I found something that I was really happy with. Um, Granted, if I had figured it out earlier, that would have been awesome, but I didn't. And so I guess I would give advice to people. If you're struggling and not quite feeling like you're doing what you want to do, always ask that question. It's like, well, what else might you want to try? And so I was grateful for the advice that I got from, I also got lots of advice from lots of friends who I nagged a lot. <laughs> Many of them are actually now still professional colleagues. Like I'm on, five grant, I'm, on, I'm on five grants with people who over the course of the last four years gave me advice about what to do. Um, and so those connections that I built have been strong and lasting. And so I was the type of person that needed a sounding board. I couldn't just dwell on it on my own. Again, that's me. Like there are plenty of people who don't need that and that's fine. So it's just good sure. to be accepting of your own personality and realize that we're all just humans trying to sort this all out. Absolutely, yeah, no, that's great. I love that. Um, you do a lot of research in STEM education, kind of like meta education research. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now? Certainly. Um, so uh, I guess two things that I'll share. One is I have a graduate student uh, right now who is finishing out his dissertation. He's graduating in December. Um, and we've been looking at how, how, the, how, how higher education institutions like CU Boulder are using planetarium facilities. Turns out there's, there's over over 300, almost, almost, half, almost 500 or more planetariums on university campuses. And we've been doing surveys of how those facilities are using their planetariums. Are they the same as FISC or different from FISC? More K-12, more college. Uh, when those college students are in the planetariums, how are professors engaging their students in learning? How are they using the theater as more than just a big theater for giving lectures? Or is that what they're doing? And so we're looking at how higher education faculty professors are using planetarium facilities in higher education learning. That's one project. Um, the other project that I'm doing is actually a, a, a carryover from the work that I did at San Luis Obispo, California when I was teaching at Cal Poly. Um, for about eight years there, I helped run a program called the STEM Teacher and Researcher Program, which is the acronym is STAR. And that program was specifically designed to provide summer research experience for future and aspiring science teachers, science, science and math teachers. So as I mentioned before, I was really grateful for having the opportunity to work at NASA Ames when I was teaching high school for those first four or five years that I taught. And the STAR program is the same idea, but for undergraduates and graduate students who are just going into teaching to help uh, future teachers realize that if you're gonna teach science and math, you should have science and math experiences as part of your preparation. 
So we ran this program for, you know, since 2007. Uh, when I left Cal Poly, we'd actually provide, provided over 600 research experiences to over almost 500 individuals. And um, we got funding from the National Science Foundation to look at whether that has made a difference in how those teachers are teaching and whether they're staying in teaching. And so I've been doing a two-year study, which is looking back at STAR Fellows from 2010 to 2016 to see what are, the, and looking at talking to the students of those teachers, talking to the supervisors of those teachers, talking to the teachers themselves, looking at test scores, looking at employment records, and basically doing a big mega study, a long, long, longitudinal study about whether providing summer research as part of teacher preparation makes a difference about how those teachers eventually teach in their classrooms. And have you gotten any results from either of those two research projects yet, or are they still very much in the works? Nope, they're all, they're in the works, but there are plenty of results are happening. Um, I, I think the, I can't tell you all the details because we're working on publications for the second project right now. Sure. But, you know, takeaway message, we actually see them, interestingly, we see the most, we see the strongest uh, signal, the strongest measurement, the strongest, you know, measurable result when we talk to the students of the teachers. Uh, both of the, the students of teachers who did research and the students of teachers who hadn't had research in their background. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, when, when teachers are self-reporting, there's a lot of like potential noise about what they're saying and what they're not saying. But it turns out students give the strongest signal. And so we've identified, we've identified five constructs that it looks like re teacher researchers are in part, that the students recognize that in the classes that, they, that they're taking. Um, in the planetarium world, it turns out most interesting result is that we're seeing that we anticipated this, but, but planetariums aren't just for astronomy anymore. Now that we've had a digital revolution, planetariums can be for art, they can be for biology, they can be for math, they can be for lots of subjects. Sure. And, and the, the survey results that we're sharing see that transition. And we use the Fisk Planetarium for a lot of, you know, you know, artistic styles, you know, of presentation too that are not strictly for astronomy. So it's cool to see everyone kind of around the world making use of these really awesome facilities. In these well, I wouldn't say around the world, but we have some, we have some evidence that, that this is, that this is happening. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, and would you say that uh, you mentioned initially that you're looking at whether planetariums, other planetariums used at higher education institutions are used the simil in similar ways that we use ours here at CU Boulder, um, do you find that there is a large similarity or are there very different ways that, that uh, planetariums are being used you know, across the US? Um, so interestingly, every planetarium, so we had about 85 responses, sorry, 80 responses. I'm not, 72 to 80 responses, 80-ish responses. Um, of, of the 200 people that we surveyed, 200 planetariums that we surveyed. And um, uh, all, 80, all 80 of those do some astronomy, but half of them do more than just astronomy. And so I guess for perspective, you know, 40 said that we only still do astronomy and 40 do a second, a third or a fourth subject in addition to astronomy. Um, so FISC is in that latter category. Like when we reported this, we, we, we do more than three subjects of besides astronomy. Uh, so, but it's only half, right? So half are still just planetariums that are astronomy. Uh, interesting, a lot of that's driven by technology because if you look at how many of those are digital theaters versus non-digital theaters, it's the non-digital theaters that are still stuck doing just astronomy and it's the digital like FISC that can open that up. And so I think the issue is that if you have the technology to show more than just astronomy, then you start to use that. Sure. Very cool. Um, well, great. Thank you. And, and really quick, before we kind of start talking about your um, planetary research, um, I want to ask if becoming the director of the Fisk Planetarium has brought with it kind of any unexpected experiences for you, you know, things that you initially were like, yes, let's be the, the director of the Fisk Planetarium. And then in retrospect, you're like, man, that was not what I was expecting, you know, or expecting to be a part of this position. Uh, I think there's always, when you take a new position, there's always things you expected and things that were just out of the blue. Um, I've been, I've just been thrilled with how amazing the staff is at Fisk. Um, I already, already sensed that this would happen, so I guess I wasn't surprised, but I was 
it's even more than I expected. Like the student staff, the 30 ish students that we have, undergraduate students we have working at Fisk, the the nine, the eight other professionals in addition to me who are helping uh, work there full time. It's just a really strong, supportive, cohesive group of individuals who are really top notch. And so it's been really just a, a very pleasant surprise to have such a great group of people to work with. Um, I've also been really pleased about just how much diversity there is in the planetarium space, right? So, you know, I was so excited about presenting our world premiere of a live interactive musical performance about the Voyager mission that was scheduled for March 13th, the day we closed due to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and so this was this beautiful synergy of, of musicians and singers who had written an entire script about the Voyager mission, one of the you know, most significant missions of NASA's history that went to the four outer gas giant planets are now the farthest things that humans have made that are out beyond our solar system. They're carrying the golden records, which tells the story of humanity. And it's just this wonderful synergy of science, art, music, amazing visuals. And so just this opportunity to do really synergistic things is really useful. And similarly, like I never thought I would be able to have as many kind of science-y, science geeky concerts as I've seen at Fisk. Uh, we've done Cosmic Kirtan, which is, you know, uh, Indian chanting around the universe. And we also had, you know, just wonderful musical groups and other individuals using the theater as a performance space. Very cool. They're just a couple of things. They're all, yeah. they've all been, they've all been pleasant surprises. No, awesome. no bad surprises, I guess. Good. No, that's great news. Very cool. Um, well, thanks, uh, Dr. John Keller. And I think I'll turn it over to Tara at this point now to uh, give a couple questions about your research in planetary science. Thanks. Yeah, so, um, so you're working on a project called RECON. It's sort of like a citizen science-y uh, observation of Kuiper Belt objects and stuff. Can you give us a little bit of a, a broad overview of kind of what RECON is? Yeah, certainly. Um, so we've talked a lot about the astronomy education research that I did, but as I mentioned before, like I've always liked astronomy and education. So I was really fortunate to have met a colleague named Mark Bowie from the Southwest Research Institute, which is here in Boulder, Colorado as well. Uh, back in 2010. Um, at that time, Mark, who's one of the, you know, he's, he's been studying Pluto for the last 35 years of his life. So he's one of the renowned astronomers who knows about the outer solar system. He approached me with an idea of creating a network of telescopes that would stretch across the entire Western United States that would be capable of measuring objects in the outer solar system using 11 inch telescopes. And so, uh, and he had the, even at that time in 2010, he had said, I want to do this with high school students. I want high school students to help me do the science that we want to do with the outer solar system. And so that's what Recon is. It's a network of, of, of 60 communities that stretches from Yuma, Arizona, right, right on the, uh, it's the southern border of the United States, up to the Colorado River, back the backside of the Sierra Nevadas, up the backside of the Cascades, all the way up into British Columbia. We go have telescopes, six telescopes, seven telescopes north of British, north of the border into British Columbia. And those 60 telescope sites are, are run by high school students, high school teachers, and community members, over 250 of them um, in those communities. The science we're trying to do is that these objects in the outer solar system called trans-Neptunian objects are out past Neptune, which is they have orbits that bring them in and out of the orbit of Neptune. And when objects in our solar system pass in front of stars, if, if that's a star, you see that's a star and an object passes in front of that star the object will make that star blink off and blink back on it'll basically block the star for a certain amount of time that's called an occultation um, occultation comes from the word occult which means to hide and so when an occultation occurs the star is being hidden by the object that's doing the occulting if you can catch that measurement of the star getting blocked you can actually figure out the size and shape and dimensions and rings and moons and other features of the object in our solar system and that's what we're doing at recon is studying studying these are known hyperbole objects and, and trans neptunian objects and we're figuring out what their properties are using this technique that's very cool and you said there were more than 250 people that are working on this with you? Yeah, so there's 60 communities. Each community has at least at least two people and some of them have 20 people involved. And so, you know, over the course of the five or seven years that we've had the project running, we have had, we've had, we've, we've interacted with well over 250 individuals. 
um, any given event. We've only had one event in the seven years where there were where, there, where it was clear skies across the entire network. I mean, this is the 2,000 kilometer network, so there's always going to be some storm front going over mostly Oregon and Washington. They've had the worst. They have the worst luck, obviously, but. There's always some fraction of those that are clouded out and not able to observe, um, but we've we've always had a certain number of telescopes. You know, on, that actually comparably, there's only there was also one night where all 60 telescopes were completely clouded out. Uh, I don't know if you remember the the Snowzilla. It was the Snowzilla storm of 2014 or 15, which caused a huge blizzard in the East Coast. And four days before that, that storm system was was marching over all of Recon. And we had no telescopes that were able to collect data that night. Um, occultations are tricky because it's not like studying a galaxy where you can point your telescope at the galaxy anytime it's clear and then like wait a couple more nights for the next night it's clear. It's actually a very precise time, like at you know 8:47 a.m. Sorry, sorry, 12:47 a.m. on a Thursday night that the at, at, that the occultation is actually occurring. And so if it happens to be cloudy or if your telescope isn't hooked up properly at that moment, then you wouldn't, then you can't actually collect data for that, that event. Um, it's been a really great opportunity to work with great, amazing teachers, amazing students, wonderful community members. Um, we really can't do this science without their help. Like I, I can't be in 50 places at once um, without, and so it's been a really great way to engage students in these, in the rural communities that we're working with. To help us to help us study our solar system. Yeah, that's very cool. And aside from like weather challenges, have you found any other like really difficult things about working with that many people? Um, I mean, it's sure it's it's not it's not simple. Um, I think the biggest challenge that people have faced is that I would say one out of every five of our team members has ever used had ever used a telescope before becoming part of this project. And so that's both a success, a challenge and a success um, challenge because we clearly need to train and provide support and help people get up to speed with how to collect the measurements we're working on. Uh, success from the sense like those communities that have become successful has been really, really have, have become, have gained amazing skills. And the other success is every, every team has come to realize just how complicated science is. Like science is not just reading something out of a textbook and saying that the solar system has this many planets. Um, it's a process by which you have to really get out there and get your feet wet or your, your, you, know, you get your cold, <laughs> you get cold if you're in the mountains in 20 degree weather uh, to get the data that you need to collect. Um, so there have been, you know, there have been clearly uh, times when people haven't been, haven't gotten on the field at the right time to collect the data that we had hoped they could get. But in each of those experiences, they've also learned to become a better observer the next time around. I think the biggest like systemic challenge, and this is kind of a broader issue for the United States in general, is that there is a significant teacher turnover rate, right? So we typically have lost roughly 10% or 10 to 12% of our teachers every year to either going to other districts that don't have our telescopes or to go into other professions. And that's just kind of the nature of, of teaching. Um, unfortunately, is that there, there is a fair amount of flux of, of individuals staying at one school for, for the five to seven years we've worked on this project. Uh, it's, not, it's no fault of the teachers, it's just the reality of the situation. And so we've had to retrain each of those communities where we've lost that, that main teacher who's, really the teacher is the glue that determines how much students get involved or don't get involved or how active the teams are. Yeah, and I think a lot of people get surprised that you're doing this whole big sort of project with these people that are definitely not professionals at this. They're brand new at getting into telescopes and science and you're doing it with a you know pretty basic off-the-shelf telescope this isn't some big you know 24 inch thing like we have up at the observatory mm -hmm. um i think p do people are they like shocked when you say yeah we're just doing this with a little 11 inch backyard telescope but we're doing all this really cool science with it well that was why i was so excited about the project when i first heard about it and i apologize for the siren noises outside <laughs> there's a fire truck going by <laughs> um yeah, the the reality is that these objects, you know, I was I was teaching high school when the first other transit when the first trans Neptunian object was discovered. And I never dreamed in my life in nineteen ninety-two 
that I could use a telescope to learn something about that. I just assumed that it was something that happened up on top of big mountains. Um, the way that, the reason this works is that we don't actually have to see the objects that we're studying because those are actually super, super faint, but we have to be able to see the star. And so as long as you have a bright enough star that's being occulted that you can see with a 11 inch telescope, then you can do the science we're talking about. And so it's the fact that there are bright stars that you can see with these small telescopes that lets us do this technique. Um, it's not the only example of how you can use um, small telescopes to do science, but it's definitely one of them. And so there, there's a range of investigations you can do. There are certain things you clearly can't do with a large telescope, and we're not trying to do those. Um, but this is a really good application of that size of a telescope. And then the, you know, the, the students and the high school teachers and middle school teachers and community members who have been part of this project, I guess I, that's just another thing I want to put a huge shout out to them. They've been phenomenal in just like, it's, it's, it's a big ask to say, I want you to use something you've never used before to measure something that's this far away with an object that that's far away, that that's dim. And there's tons of learning that's happened, but they've been really st stellar, you know, participants of just getting in there and, and getting their feet wet and, and doing your best. Cause that's all that you can do, right? You just give everything your best shot and you learn from every experience that you have. Yeah, and you guys were actually able to use this sort of occultation technique in the recon network to support the New Horizons mission in their observations of that new object, Erica. Mm -hmm. Like, was that super exciting for these kids to be involved in like a huge NASA mission? So for Erica, which was the second target of New Horizons after Pluto, um, we did not have any students who officially helped with that campaign, but we did have about a half a dozen or more teachers who are part of the recon network who we deployed to Africa and South America to participate. You actually had to be in the southern hemisphere to measure Erika. And so those half a dozen recon teachers were huge contributors. It was part of the, these were epic 60 and 80 person teams that did the science and they were they were parts of those teams. There's a new mission that's that's coming that's going to launch this decade that is another outer solar system studier. It's called the Lucy mission. And it's specifically gonna study the um, Trojan asteroid belt, which are the Trojan asteroids are asteroids that are trapped in front of and behind Jupiter in, its, in their orbits around the sun. They're all about the same distance as Jupiter from the sun. And due to the gravitational interaction of Jupiter to the sun, uh, they are sitting in these places that are stable places for asteroids. And Lucy is gonna actually uh, fly by five of those Trojans. Um, we did have, we actually had recon contributed, huge, we actually just, the paper just got submitted last week. Um, we had a team of recon specific people in, in Cal Northern California and Southern Oregon who deployed a very special deployed group of eight telescopes to measure one of those objects, um, the Lucas, the Lucas Trojan asteroid. And so they made a measurement that's, that's, that's one fifth of the publication. We did five of these occultations and the recon team members were part of that one. And we're gonna do more of those. We're doing another Lucy mission in September coming up um, of, a, of an asteroid called Euripides. Euripides. Um, and so more and more of these deployable campaigns of targeted asteroids that NASA's flying missions to is, is awesome. Yeah, that's really great. Um, so you're involving high school students and teachers, and you said you had a grad student, and I know you work with undergrads too. We're talking to one of your undergrads here in a couple of weeks, Ryder. He's going to be on the podcast. Yep. Um, and you also taught a research methods course here at CU last semester, so kind of giving people more of a structured introduction to research and observation mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, do you think what they're experiencing in the classroom with this sort of thing is the same or different, better or worse than just throwing them into a general like research position sort of thing? Yeah, so this is a great question that you've asked. Um, like, as, as you have heard, I'm kind of passionate about research experiences, having done that as a high school teacher and beyond. Um, the, 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 the class that I just finished teaching uh, uh, just last week, was it just last week? Last week. Um, yeah was what, what we in the field call a course-based undergraduate research experience. Because we did teach this, we provided an undergraduate research experience about recon for undergraduates in a course. Um, the undergraduates who were working with helped us analyze the data that our teams had collected out in the field. 
And we had hoped to do our own campaign, but we got COVIDized, so we weren't able to go use our telescopes in the spring. But anyway, we, we were able to analyze data and contribute to some papers that we were working with. Um, those students had definitely an authentic experience working with real messy data and understanding all the challenges that comes into working with real research in that way. It, it's not quite the same as having a focused mentored one-on-one -on -one experience, where, which was which what you call just a traditional undergraduate research experience. And the main reason, but the, but the main benefit I see to cures, course-based research experiences, is they're much more scalable. Um, like we, I was able to work with 19 students instead of two. Uh, I'm still working with the two that I mentor uh, in the summers and during the school year, but 19 is a, 20 is a factor of 10 is one, one order of magnitude bigger than two. And so it's a way, it's been an opportunity to spread that opportunity and experience to more individuals. So sure, and, and it's been research, like they were asking the same questions that we ask and dealing with the same challenges that my, my two undergraduates were dealing with. Um, it was actually a really great op opportunity to work with so many great undergraduates on this project. Awesome. Very cool. So as we wrap up here, Dr. John Keller, I want to ask- sorry for, ta sorry for talking so much. No, this is, this is perfect. This is, <laughs> yeah, this is great. the point. Um, is there anything, I'm going to kind of change directions here. Is there anything that you're particularly stoked about coming up in the future of the Fisk Planetarium as we kind of look to the horizon of the uh, the coronavirus situation, but also just in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think both in the short term and the long term. In the short term, um, I just want to really re encourage people to stay connected. Um, we've been doing our best to provide virtual FISC and dome to home and really to stay connected to the, the Boulder Front Range Denver metro area community. Um, we realize this has been a super challenging time for everyone and um, parents and kids alike and non-parents, every, every human being on the planet is affected by the COVID crisis right now. And so uh, I'd really encourage people to stay tuned in to, we're gonna run Dome to Home through the entire summer. We're actually looking to do some virtual live stream concerts with DJs that you may have heard of um, that we would broadcast onto the web. And so for the duration that we aren't able to have people in our theater, we're really trying to make as much of a virtual experience possible as we can. Um, when we do reopen, and I don't know when that's going to be, but we will reopen at some point. But when we do reopen, we're reopening with actually a, a significant number of upgrades to our theater. Uh, we went digital in 2013, and that was the biggest surprise. I'd forgotten the computers don't last more than seven or eight years. And so we actually are now replacing our 26 computer system with an eight computer system uh, seven years later, eight years later, seven years later, uh, that will be faster have new software, have new capabilities for doing live feeds on the dome. And so we'll have just way more, even more visual capabilities than FISC already had. And then we're also still working out the final details, but fingers, all fingers and toes crossed, uh, we're gonna be installing a flooring area on the pit that is currently in the center of our theater. We have a big, uh, a big circular pit that our former projector used to be in that is kind of unusable space that we'll be covering up with a floor area that will allow us to have kids laying down in bean bags underneath the stars. We'll be able to have way more access of people doing kinesthetic activities uh, as they're learning underneath the dome. We'll be able to do larger venue concert events where you don't have to stay in your seat the whole time. If you do wanna get up and move around, you can do that. Um, and I think it's just gonna give the space an even bigger, more expansive feel than it already has. So I guess, Look forward to the physical upgrades that we anticipate, and then also stay connected to us virtually um, until we've been able to, to, to reopen. We're very excited to be able to reopen. It's just a matter of when, because we want to make sure that we do it safely. Uh, safety is always going to be our biggest concern. Um, just we, we need to make sure that people who are coming to this theater know that they will be, um, that they will have, one, they'll have an awesome experience, but two, they'll remember that, off of, remember that off of, off of awesome experience. Uh, you know, for the rest of their lives. Very cool. Well, uh, Dr. John Keller, thanks so much for joining us today on the Fisk Planetarium podcast, soon to be officially named. Um, it has been such a pleasure to talk with you and, and learn so much about what it is that you're doing um, and, you know, make everyone excited about what's coming up in the future for the planetarium.
Yeah, and thanks to you, Tara and Colin and John for, for putting this together. I mean, I know, that, I know that you've thought about this and wanted to do it for a number of months and, um, you know, silver lining, we are finally now initiating what hopefully is going to be a lasting yes. thing that you will tell people 10 years from now, I started the podcast. <laughs> like, I wrote Kids in Space. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 Well, we're really looking forward to see where this goes. So it'll be a really good time. Awesome. awesome. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks so much.